Yes. I do look like Beyonce Kardashian because I'm filming this on the day that I just got done with my photo shoot for my birthday. Mm -hmm. Hello there my lemon slices and welcome back to the lemonade stand or welcome if you are new. My name is Brianna. I am a certified personal trainer, a big huge biology nerd, and a registered dietitian 2B. We are gathered here today for another reaction video and I will be reacting to fan favorite Jillian Michaels as she tells us how to get flat abs fast. Before we proceed, if you love science-based health, wellness, and fitness education with some lols and some dry sarcasm along the way, hit that subscribe button and join the lemonade stand. I would seriously love to have you here. Without further ado, let's make lemonade. So this is an older video. It's from like December 2020, I think the date on it said. Um, I mean, I guess it's not super old. It's titled Flat Abs Fast. Simple steps to burn belly fat and flatten your stomach. Jillian Michaels. Already I have problems with the title. Every fitness professional in the history of humankind should know that there is absolutely no way to spot reduce body fat <laughs> in certain parts of your body, like just by choosing to. This is a myth that needs to die a painful and cheese grater related death. I'm drinking a sparkling white tea and pomegranate juice, by the way, it's from Trader Joe's. I, as well as every fitness professional I have ever encountered in my entire life is sick to death of hearing this myth. For me, it's right up there next to muscle weighs more than fat and don't eat carbs after 8 p.m. Yes, I know muscle is denser than fat and therefore takes up less space than fat, but it doesn't weigh more than fat. A pound of muscle and a pound of fat are both a pound. I have to add that because if I don't, it never ever fails. Someone would have commented and have been like, well, actually Brianna, muscle's denser than fat. I know that, I know. But guess what? One pound of muscle does not weigh more than one pound of fat, Karen. Sorry, I'm zesty today. I think it's the hair. Anyway, based on my knowledge, where we lose and gain body fat comes down a lot to uh, genetic predisposition and gender. For example, females generally have a higher amount of adiposity, body fat, in our hip and thigh area than men do. I learned in school, this is likely due to the higher uh, activity of the enzyme lipoprotein lipase or LPL. Specifically in females, LPL has higher activity in the gluto-femoral area, which is your butt and your, and your thighs. One of the jobs of LPL is to break down circulating triglycerides and store them within adipocytes, fat cells, as fatty acids. So if women tend to have higher LPL activity in our hips and thighs than men do, the result is typically more fat storage in these areas. Thanks, biology. Just to share a personal anecdote, when I'm losing body fat, the first place it tends to go for me is my waist, and the last place it tends to go for me is my, uh, like, my butt hip area. The booty is just relentless. So I say all that just to reiterate, you really can't just decide to lose body fat in one area and then just it, you just do a bunch of a specific exercise and then you just lose fat in that area. It's not really how it works. I feel like I have to mention this too because I feel like if I don't, somebody else will. Obviously there's like uh, the surgical, the surgical route, you know, cosmetic surgery, but we're not talking about cosmetic surgery, okay? Smart asses, because I know somebody was gonna say it. But yeah, let's go ahead and let Jilly Bean talk. It's a little over an eight minute long video, so we won't be here all day. I think by far and away, the videos I have done on my YouTube channel regarding abs and belly fat are doing exponentially better than any other video I have ever posted by literally thousands, tens of thousands of views. So I thought I- It's not that surprising, honestly. That's a common- thing like a lot of people want to figure out how to lose um belly fat so that's not that surprising really i might do one on six pack abs or how to get a flat stomach because i mean let's be honest do you really need like the like captain america probably not right i don't even have that it's just a flat lean stomach with definition we all want it clearly the youtube search says so so all right how do we do it it's twofold and i'm betting you guys know this we gotta work on our food while simultaneously working on the fitness. And here's why. Because you can have the strongest ab muscles in the world, but if you've got subcutaneous fat sitting on top of them, you're just never gonna see them. So subcutaneous fat is the fat that sits under the skin, and in this case, right, we're on top of your, for our purposes, 
subcutaneous fat. That is absolutely true. And something that I see a lot of people do is they're like, oh, well, I, I want I want abs. Like I want uh, I want to be able to see my abs. And so they start doing a million crunches. But really, um, abs really only become visible when you have a lower enough body fat percentage. By body fat, like she said, about subcutaneous fat specifically. So it does really come down to having a low body fat percentage of subcutaneous fat. So the lower your body fat, the more visible your abs are. On top of your abdominal muscles. There's different kinds of fat. We've talked about it, visceral fat between the organs, ectopic fat in the organs. Subcutaneous fat is what sits under the skin and kind of inhibits our definition. So that's what we want to burn off. Now, in order to do that, if you have a large amount of subcutaneous fat or even a moderate amount of subcutaneous fat, on those muscles, we, we've got to burn it. You've got to eat less. So first, let's look at the food. Number one, you got to create a calorie deficit. So if this is like problem area time, right? Five pounds, 10 pounds. That's absolutely true. Generally, what fat loss comes down to for most humans is creating a calorie deficit. Obviously, there are a lot of additional factors that go far beyond that, but that's mostly what it comes down to. When I see people doing all kinds of crazy things to lose weight, like taking crazy supplements or like some kind of crazy weird diet method or something like that, a lot of times that stuff is literally pissing money away. Because again, for most of us, if you don't create a calorie deficit, you won't lose weight. We just talked about a recent example. These beach body coaches from the four week gut protocol showing all their amazing before and after photos. It's not amazing. All you did was create a calorie deficit by eating less food and exercising. And then you lost weight because that's what biology is. Congratulations, science works for you. In that situation, they attributed their weight loss to the program. And then you have people who do some, I don't know, like chug apple cider vinegar or something like that. And then they attribute their weight loss to that. But really it's, it's probably not that thing. It's just because you created a calorie deficit. And you're looking for that definition. You wanna go good to insane, great, amazing. You want to create about a 500 calorie a day deficit. More here is not more. And that's because your body- Okay, <laughs> uh, more words. I don't know how she can just say you need to cut out 500 calories a day like that just as a blanket statement for everybody. That one piece of general advice is not going to work for every single person who watches this. For example, me personally, I maintain at around 1800 to 2000 calories a day. If I go with the lower end of that and cut 500 calories from 1800, that's 1300 calories a day. Barely enough room for Oreos. Will I lose weight eating 1300 calories a day? Oh, absolutely. But that honestly, to me, sounds like a miserable existence. That's extremely restrictive. And realistically, most people probably won't sustain that because it's so restrictive. 500 is just a lot to start out with too for weight loss. For weight loss in school, I was taught that you should really start more modestly at like uh, between like 150 to 200 calories per day. That's much less drastic and a lot more doable too for the average person. He does not want to lose more weight. You might want ab definition, but your body is like, I'm actually good, I'm healthy, I feel good here. So that good to great, no more than 500 calories a day with your deficit. So if you're burning 2,500, don't eat less than 2,000, all right? So with regard to intake, that's rule number one. Rule number two is yes, food quality does count, but I can make this really simple, all right? No refined grains, processed grains, refined sugars, the white stuff. Cut it out, the white rice, the white pasta, the white bread, the white sugar, sodas, juices, crap. You know what I mean. Don't eat crap. Now, mm. Mm -mm -mm. no refined foods, no junk foods. Don't eat crap. If any of you have your terrible weight loss advice bingo cards handy, go ahead and check off the little box there. Uh, no junk and no white carbs. Did you know that you can actually eat white carbs and still lose body fat? Did you know that you can actually eat Oreos and still lose body fat? Did you know that it's scientifically proven that one Oreo per day has been shown to be beneficial to everyone's health? Okay, maybe that last one is not entirely true but Oreo still tastes good. Yeah, this is yet another myth about like weight loss and dieting. And I'm sure like every nutrition professional everywhere is just sick to death of hearing it. Don't eat white carbs, don't eat processed food. That stuff makes you fat, nom nom nom. Guess what? No, it doesn't. You can overeat 
anything. You can overeat broccoli the same way you could overeat ice cream. I think uh, the largest reason, and this is kind of a, I can say this is a theory, but I mean, I've talked to a lot of professionals who kind of agree with this. The reason why it seems like whenever you cut out like processed foods and junk foods and lose weight, like for a lot of people, they cut out those foods and it really does seem like, oh wow, I lost weight. And then they attribute it to, oh, well I stopped eating carbs. So that's why I lost weight. Ultimately, again, what it came down to was that you created an energy deficit, but also a lot of the, uh, the high calorie foods that in the average American diet is typically very high in sugar, very processed. People drink their calories too. So when you cut out those foods, you're cutting out a significant amount of your daily calorie intake. So yeah, of course you're gonna lose weight, but it's really not so much, oh, well, I stopped eating processed food and therefore I lost weight. It's you stopped eating processed food and therefore reduce a large amount of your daily calorie intake and that resulted in weight loss. Now, I do agree with her. Food quality absolutely matters. 100 calories of broccoli and 100 calories of ice cream, yes, are both 100 calories, but they have very different nutrient profiles. Broccoli has more fiber, more vitamin C, and it's actually one of the very few vegetables that has kind of a decent protein profile as well. 100 calories of ice cream is probably mostly sugar and fat. Guess what though? Neither one is necessarily worse than the other though. They're just different. It's food and it has a different nutrient profile than ice cream. That's the language I personally prefer to use. I don't say, oh, that's healthy, that's unhealthy, that's good, that's bad. I hate saying that and I never say that. I prefer to say broccoli is more nutrient dense or more nutritious than ice cream, but it's not better than ice cream. As long as your calorie and nutrient goals are being met, then eating a few cookies is perfectly okay. What am I doing with my hand? This good food, bad food attitude is not balanced at all. And it really leaves no room at all for anything. And then whenever that happens, people over restrict themselves so that they are good. And that usually results in them binge eating from the over restriction. And then they feel bad about themselves because they had some cookies or some cake. Should you eat your veggies? Absolutely. And I really hope you do because they are delicious and nutritious and very good for you. But is ice cream bad for you? And should you avoid it? No. I mean, I am making the assumption that you don't eat a whole tub every night. It's moderation and balance. Now, it's about to get even worse. Alcohol. I'm so sorry, but if you are looking to get lean and shredded, alcohol does not help. It's okay for your overall health. In fact, it's good for your health to have four, even up to six drinks a week. It helps prime a certain enzyme in your liver. It helps improve cognitive punk but cognitive, well, clearly not drinking enough, cognitive function and remove amyloid plaques from your brain to inhibit Alzheimer's. Some of it has antioxidants like red wine and dark beer, but when it comes to getting lean, you wanna get lean, you gotta stop drinking, period. And the next one. There is definitely some very interesting and compelling research surrounding alcohol consumption and like cardiovascular health. I don't know why I glazed over this while I was actually filming this video. She touched on Alzheimer's briefly. And I forgot to mention that um, I did want to add that there is also interesting research surrounding um, uh, moderate alcohol consumption and um, the P potential that it has to prevent Alzheimer's disease. I found some recent evidence and some recent research that does support um, that bit of what she said. However, I don't agree with her just kind of like declaring that. The official website for Alzheimer's disease, it, it does say that um, moderate alcohol consumption has been shown to help prevent Alzheimer's disease onset. So I will link some of that literature below. Obviously, overconsumption of alcohol pretty much always has negative effects on your health. It can lead to high blood pressure and increased risk for a uh, heart attack or stroke, fatty liver disease. What does this come down to? Moderation. And it's also true that red wine has polyphenols, which is the name of the antioxidant compounds found in red wine that are known to be very, very good for you. I remember for a long time, I don't know, there's probably some doctors around here that still do this. I remember for a long time there was doctors prescribing people a glass of red wine a night for like, for their heart. Anybody else remember that? I remember I, I had that one aunt that was like, my doctor told me to drink a glass of red wine every night. And I was like, okay, auntie, go off. My education on alcohol and health is that it's generally considered to be perfectly okay in moderation for most healthy humans, adults. But also if you are somebody who doesn't drink really at all, don't start just for the potential benefits. You're still perfectly healthy if you don't ever drink ever. And then as far as weight loss goes, alcohol calories are metabolized a little bit differently. Alcohol is actually about seven calories per gram. So alcohol does provide more energy. That being said, it's my understanding that it would be treated the exact same way um, 
like as you would treat any sort of weight loss pursuits. Yes, it does provide more calories per gram than regular carbohydrates, but again, if your nutrient and energy needs are being met, I would think that a glass of wine is okay for most people. Sometimes if I have a stressful day of watching a multi-level marketing distributors talk about uh, how the four-week gut protocol changed their life. I have to have a glass of wine while I'm making dinner. So yeah. <laughs> Drink a lot of water and limit your sodium intake. And this is because sodium, while being a transient mineral, it doesn't make you permanently gain weight. It will make you hold water and it can mess up your definition and overall hydration, as we know, boosts metabolism, gives you energy, is better for your body's natural detoxification process. In other words, it lets the liver, the kidneys, the spleen, all that stuff do their job better. It's just better for you. So drink water and then your body won't hold water and don't pound salt. So these are the food rules. Who the hell's pounding salt? I, you know what? That's that's messed up because I just said that and you know like the 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 margarita salt that they have like on the edge of glasses like in those little like those little containers. I have one downstairs because my husband will just like lick it sometimes as a snack. So, you know, I just said who pounds salt like uh you're married to somebody who freaking pounds salt. I have to take that from him sometimes. He has bad genes and I'm just like, listen, I don't need you dropping dead of a massive coronary in the next five years, okay? And that is a real conversation that I've had with my husband before while he's licking salt. <laughs> so food rule, those are her food rules. These are my food rules. Drink water, eat vegetables, pet dogs. Those are the only rules I live by. And yes, merch that says that is coming. Now, fitness, you would think that you should be doing crunches all day long, and that's not the case. So we're gonna take this in three parts. The first thing are, what fitness techniques are gonna burn more fat? Well, HIIT training and strength training. And strength training done in a metabolic fashion. So you're not gonna like do a set of pull downs and then sit there and twiddle your thumbs. You're gonna move your ass. So it's like pull downs, squats, push-ups, lunges, you keep it moving. If ever you've done any of my workouts, you see I keep it moving. And these high intensity workouts, and high intensity training techniques are just more metabolic. They burn more body fat. So if you sit there and you do crunches, it's not gonna get the fat. It, it will strengthen the muscle, but it won't help you burn the fat off of the top of the muscle, okay? She said strength train in a metabolic fashion. Then she went on to say you should basically just be like moving your ass, not resting between sets. So doing high intensity stuff with like minimal rest. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you should train that way if you like it. I like to train that way sometimes, but that's not the only way to reduce body fat. Plenty of people lose weight just by eating in a calorie deficit and then like sticking to weight training and then a few cardio sessions a week. I think she's probably saying that this way of training is more conducive to fat loss because it expends the most energy, the most calories. But it certainly is not the only way. For some people, just taking a daily walk can help get them started on their on their fat loss journey. However, I, I just said all that, but I do have to remember the title of this video. It's Flat Abs Fast. So really, I mean, I guess she's not wrong in that respect. Like if you wanna lose body fat as fast as possible, then like, yeah, I guess just do a bunch of high intensity training and like, yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> All right, we had to take a short break because my camera overheated. Where's my lip gloss? Now, after you've done that type of workout, you may notice if I'm in an active recovery exercise where I'm letting my heart rate come down from a hit interval or I have come to the end of my workout because I personally don't like to fatigue the hell out of your core when you're doing complex movements that require multiple muscle groups because you need your core. A push-up, for example, you need your core to be strong. So I don't want to sit there and hammer your abs before we do push-ups because it can compromise your form. And a push-up is going to be more effective than just a regular plank. It's a dynamic plank that's working more muscle groups, so it burns more calories, right? And it's more time efficient. So you've done your total body workout and you're utilizing these more aggressive techniques like HIIT, strength training, and metabolic conditioning, circuit training. Great. Now, when we drill down to actually isolating those abs, which you do either during, or I do, either during active recovery as my heart rate's coming down or at the end of the workout, and now it's called finishers, I used to call it blitz and polish, right? We just hammer that muscle at the end. You've done all that hard fat burning work, get the metabolism up, build up your epoch or your afterburn effect, burn those calories, awesome. Now we wanna really chisel those muscles and hammer them. You weren't doing that before with all the other stuff you were doing? <laughs> Here are a few of the mistakes I see people make. So first thing, 
you start with your lower abs and I see a lot of leg raises, but in essence to really work those lower abs, you need to lift your pelvis. So if you've ever seen me do leg raises hanging from a bar or reverse crunches, it's about lifting my pelvis off of the floor, getting my spine in flexion. Because if I'm just lifting my legs, yes, I'll feel it in my abs, but it's a lot of hip flexor work, quads are working. The key is to roll your pelvis up. I'm gonna try to insert something here if I can figure out how to use the program on my computer. Um, so we hammer those. Then when you work your upper abs, I see a lot of pulling and swinging and crunching. You wanna lift your shoulders up, same concept. And I want you to think about bringing the bottom rib down to the hip bone. So you're folding here when you're doing your upper abdominal work, all right? So it's not about pulling on your neck, it's about lifting the shoulder blades up and trying to get this bottom rib to crunch towards the hip bone. Uh, another thing, very important, matching the breath to the movement. So when you're crunching, right? Or you're that was interesting. I've never heard that, uh... I've never heard that cue before, like, lift your, let's just say your lower rib to your hip bone. I mean, it's like, it's a crunch. I mean, I guess that could be a cue if you're like telling somebody how to crunch. I'm trying to do it right now. So when you are doing abdominal training and you do things like leg raises, those do get your abs involved, but exercises in which you're kind of lifting your, lifting your legs, lifting your hips up, those are actually targeting your hip flexors more. I definitely made this mistake a lot when I was a rookie trainer and didn't know jack shit besides what fitness influencers told me. So the six pack part of your abs is called your rectus abdominis. These and your obliques pretty much make up your like ab complex. When I'm training abdominals, which is not very often, or when I'm coaching someone to train abs, I don't really include very much like leg slash hip raising stuff. Because like I said, that stuff largely gets the hip flexors more involved than the actual abs. Not saying your abs don't show up at all to the party, but it is mostly like a hip flexors party. They show up, they walk into the party, and then they're like, hey, we're here to flex. I'll see myself out. So for me personally, for ab training, I like to focus more on stuff that gets the entire core involved. Elbow planks, oblique planks, bear crawls, elbow, like the elbow to knee touch, I can never freaking remember uh, the name of it. And then lots of yoga too. And if I actually wanna like target abdominals, like really emphasize them, I don't mind doing things like crunches and then, you know, like the millions of variations that crunches have. Or if I'm in the gym and I feel like it, I'll use the ab crunch machine. All right, we got a little over a minute left so I'm gonna I'm gonna play it. You're shortening the muscle so to speak. You're exhaling but don't exhale pressing your stomach out. Exhale and draw your belly button in for a deeper contraction for a full exhalation so that belly button should go in not pushing out okay and remember you inhale as you lower back down and the muscle is stretching exhale as it's contracting and you're shortening the muscle drawing the belly button in for deeper, more effective contraction. And then when you're done with the lower body stuff and the upper body stuff, then you can do moves like bicycle crunches that work the obliques and the intercostals. And we recruit all of the abdominal muscles to really hammer the hell out of your abs and finish strong. Now, if you do everything I just said, I guarantee you, you're going from good to great. You got five, 10, 15 pounds to lose. Within three months, worst case scenario, you will see that six pack or at least a really lean defined stomach. Within three months of doing all these things? That's an awfully big check, Jilly Bean. You sure you're gonna be able to cash that? In conclusion, that was interesting. In my opinion, uh, Jillian Michaels frequently echoes the same annoying diety paradigms that we see and hear all the time in social media. Cut out processed foods, no white carbs, do super intense training. It's annoying, but I guess it's good content for you guys, so here we are. I have tried to do research before on Jillian Michaels, like her actual background. Based on my research, she was briefly in college at uh, Cal State Northridge, but I've yet to find what exactly she studied and when she graduated, so that kind of leads me to believe that uh, I don't, maybe she didn't graduate. I saw a couple sources that said that she didn't graduate college. So is it safe to say she probably didn't graduate? I don't know. But like, why, if, does anybody else know that information? Why is that so hard to find? I just, I'm curious. I just want to know if she has like a background in like exercise science or something like that. And then most places call her a celebrity trainer, which...
it's so bizarre to me that we keep giving people like that a platform. <laughs> there are much more knowledgeable influencers to follow in this space. I'll list some of my favorites below in the description box because you guys are always asking, so I'm going to do that in this video. If in fact you made it to the end of this video, comment, comment Beyonce Kardashian, but that's a little bit much. So actually, how about you just comment BK and let me know that you made it to, the, to this point in the video. Thank you so very much for watching. You guys are amazing little lemon slices and I love you all so much. Like, subscribe, follow me on Instagram. Check out my fitness guides on my website. That will be linked below. And yeah, I think that's it. I will see you guys in the next one. Bye. Let's hurry up and go find the dogs before my camera dies. Oh, don't look. You guys can see I'm wearing sweatpants. Oh, no one's in there. They're all downstairs on the couch, I bet. Mm-hmm. Caught you. I caught all of you. All of you. Don't you turn your head away from me, ma'am. I don't know what it is about the lighting and the camera right now, but it just makes the cover look dirtier than it looks, or I don't know. Actually, it probably is just that dirty. It is. It is. We gotta take it off and clean it. Don't worry, guys. Our couch underneath this is absolutely beautiful. We keep the cover on it because I have three wild animals in my home. Why are you guys acting so tired? Your lives hard? Oh my goodness, you are so handsome. <gasps> Who's a handsome boy? Who's a handsome boy? Alex has a birthday this summer. His birthday is August. And he is turning nine. He, he's a handsome old man. Zeus's birthday is also in August. His birthday's at the end of August. And you gonna be a big boy, you gonna be seven. All right, Alpha, would you like to say bye? Bye, baby. Bye-bye.